Chapter Zero of Guy Fawkes, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. sixteen o five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Guy Fawkes, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. sixteen o five with the development of the principles of the conspirators and some notices of the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by the rev thomas lathbury m a london john w parker west strand preface though the particulars connected with the gunpowder treason may be perused in the general histories of the period yet i am not aware that any modern narrative of that dark design is to be found in a separate form many brief sketches have indeed been published in various modern works but no full and complete history of the treason has ever been set forth in compiling the present volume i have collected from various quarters all the information which i could discover on the subject it will be found to be the most complete narrative of the treason ever published in a detached form at the same time it is sufficiently concise not to weary the patience of the reader as to the seasonableness of such a publication there can be but one opinion among churchmen the aspect of the times the rapid advances of romanism the appointment of certain roman catholics to high and important offices in the state and the continence given to popery in high places are circumstances which naturally direct the attention of all reflecting persons to the principles of that church which has recently appeared to gain fresh strength in this country the question must force itself upon the notice of every true protestant the church of england is assailed on every side simply because she is the strongest bulwark ever erected against the encroachments of popery and history proves that from the period of the reformation our own church has been unceasingly attacked in some way or other by the advocates of romanism it is therefore very desirable that we should consult the past history of our country in order that we may discover how the active emissaries of rome have always acted the gunpowder treason is one of the darkest tragedies in our domestic history and the present work contains a faithful narrative of that detestable conspiracy i have endeavoured also to exhibit the principles on which the conspirators acted and i have proved that these principles are still retained by the church of rome in order to furnish the reader with a full view of the working of popish principles i have given a sketch of all the papal attempts against queen elizabeth in the last chapter i have inserted the act of parliament for the observance of the fifth of november i have printed the act because there are many clergymen who have never seen it and who are not acquainted with the few works in which it is to be found the clergy are commanded to read this act every year on the fifth of november and as it is not easily to be procured or at all events is not attainable in a separate form i cannot but conceive that i am performing an acceptable service in thus placing it before the public it is my earnest hope that the publication of this little volume may be the means of bringing some of my clerical brethren to a better observance of the day i have also noticed the variations which the service for the fifth of november has undergone since its first publication in sixteen o six to its final revision in sixteen eighty nine it is true that every one knows something of the history of the gunpowder treason but it is also true that very few are acquainted with those principles which gave it birth we see in this treason to what lengths the principles of the church of rome have led their votaries and who can assert that she is in any respect changed the romanist denies that the principles of his church are changed nay 
he must do so or renounce the doctrine of infallibility which is incompatible with change why then should protestants volunteer assertions respecting the altered character of popery when the papists themselves deny the fact altogether i may venture to assert that the individual who advances such a statement is ignorant of the real principles of the church of rome bath october eighteen thirty nine end of preface chapter one of guy fawkes or a complete history of the gunpowder treason a d sixteen o five this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Guy Fawkes, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. 1605, by Thomas Lathbury. Chapter 1. A Sketch of Papal Attempts in England and Ireland During the Reign of Elizabeth, The State of Religion, and the country on james's accession as an introduction to the subject of which this volume professes more especially to treat i purpose to give a sketch of the proceedings of the emissaries of rome in this country during the long reign of queen elizabeth queen mary died a d fifteen fifty eight when her sister elizabeth succeeded her on the throne paul the fourth at this time occupied the papal chair but in less than a year after her accession he was removed by death and was succeeded by pius the fourth both these pontiffs were quiet and moderate men compared with several of those who came after them at all events they did not proceed to those extremities to which their successors resorted there were indeed parties in the court of rome who laboured to induce these pontiffs to excommunicate the queen as a heretic and a usurper but recollecting the fatal consequences which had issued from the hasty proceedings of clement against henry the eighth or probably imagining that greater benefits would result from gentle than from violent measures they pursued a moderate course exhorting the queen to return to her allegiance to the see of rome and even making promises of concessions respecting the reformation in fifteen sixty six pius v was promoted to the papal chair in a very brief space he gave indications of a departure from the moderate counsels of his two immediate predecessors the efforts of philip the second of spain were also during the early years of this reign directed to the same object with those of paul the fourth and pius the fourth the king was anxious to marry elizabeth in order that he might exercise his influence in england and as long as he could entertain a hope that his wishes would be realized he seconded the moderate measures of the roman pontiff his expectations on this subject were destined to disappointment when perceiving that a marriage with a queen was out of the question he directed his attention towards the accomplishment of his designs on this country by other means than those of treaty and diplomacy as soon as pius v was fixed in the papal chair a different line of policy therefore was pursued towards england some few years indeed elapsed before the queen was actually excommunicated but conspiracies and treasons were contrived at rome with a view to their execution as soon as suitable persons could be found for the purpose pius v was the pontiff by whom the bull of excommunication against elizabeth was issued the document was dated march fifteen sixty nine or fifteen seventy according to the present mode of computation hitherto the court of rome had abstained from any direct attempt against the queen and the country but from this time plots were contrived and treasons planned in rapid succession for when one scheme was frustrated by the vigilance of the government another was adopted so that the whole reign of elizabeth with the exception of the early portion of it was constantly developing some machination or other devised by the emissaries of rome 
at the head of the confederacy against the queen were the pope and the king of spain who hated her with the most deadly hatred the former because she was the chief stay of the reformation the latter because she was an obstacle to the prosecution of his designs on this country footnote i subjoin a few extracts from the bull issued against elizabeth it was entitled the damnation and excommunication of queen elizabeth it commenced thus he that reigneth on high committed one holy catholic and apostolic church out of which there is no salvation to one alone upon earth namely to peter and to peter's successor the bishop of rome him alone he made prince over all people and all kingdoms to pluck up destroy scatter consume plant and build that he may contain the faithful that are knit together with the band of charity in the unity of the spirit then after an enumeration of elizabeth's alleged crimes against the holy see his holiness proceeds we do out of the fullness of our apostolic power declare the aforesaid elizabeth being a heretic and a favourer of heretics to have incurred the sentence of anathema and to be cut off from the unity of the body of christ and moreover we do declare her to be deprived of her pretended title to the kingdom aforesaid and of all dominion dignity and privilege and also the nobility subjects and people of the said kingdom and all others who have in any sort sworn unto her to be for ever absolved from any such oath and we do command and interdict all and every the noblemen subjects and people that they presume not to obey her or her monitions mandates and laws it is necessary to give these extracts in the outset in order that it may be seen that the gunpowder treason and almost all other treasons in the reigns of elizabeth and james flowed from the doctrines thus promulgated by the papal see End of footnote the first act of rebellion was the attempt of the earls of westmoreland and northumberland this was soon after the bull was issued in all the treasons and rebellions of this reign some of the priests of rome were more or less concerned and these two earls were instigated to the attempt by morton an englishman and a priest who was sent into england by the pope himself for the express purpose of stirring up rebellion this design however was strangled in its birth and its promoters paid the penalty of their lives in fifteen seventy six pius v paid the debt of nature and was succeeded by gregory the thirteenth who did not depart from the practices of his predecessor stukeley another subject of the queen's was authorized to go into ireland by his holiness and the king of spain and the pope had the presumption to pretend to confer the title of marquis and earl of several places in that country he was commissioned to stir up rebellion the pope engaging to supply men and the king of spain promising supplies of money the purpose was however defeated but the next year several individuals were actually sent into ireland accompanied as usual by sanders a priest who was possessed with legantine authority from his holiness to encourage the irish a banner consecrated by the pope was sent over and every other means was resorted to which the most inveterate enmity could devise the pontiff also sent them his apostolical benediction granting to all who should fall in the attempt against the heretics a plenary indulgence for all their sins and the same privileges as were conferred on those who fell in battle against the turks sanders however died miserably and the attempt completely failed it was about the year fifteen eighty that the seminary priests who were so designated from the circumstance of being trained in certain seminaries on the continent instituted especially for english priests began to come over into england for the express purpose of enforcing the bull of excommunication against the queen these men were natives of england 
though educated on the continent they assumed various disguises on their arrival travelling from place to place to promote the grand design which had been projected at rome they endeavoured to execute the bull by making various attempts upon the queen's life from which however she was mercifully delivered two points were constantly kept in view the one to stir up dissensions at home among the queen's subjects the other to induce the papal sovereigns to promise men and arms whenever it should be deemed desirable to make a descent on the country many of these men were executed as traitors though the romanists pretend that they were martyrs for their religion footnote for a full discussion of the question whether the priests and others who suffered death at this period and subsequently were punished for religion or for treason the author's work the state of popery and jesuitism in england may be consulted in that work i have entered fully into the subject and have proved that all the parties who suffered were executed for treason End footnote it is true that their religious views led them into treason and rebellion yet they were no more martyrs for their faith than the murderer who was executed at tyburn parsons and campion were the leaders of this body the former escaped to the continent the latter was taken and executed for his treasonable practices it is constantly asserted by roman catholic writers that the priests who suffered during this reign were martyrs to the faith and the inference is attempted to be drawn that the church of england is as much exposed to the charge of persecution as the church of rome one thing is certain however that whether the advisers of elizabeth were justified in their course or otherwise they did not consider that they were putting men to death for religion but on the other hand the martyrs under queen mary were committed to the flames as heretics not as traitors or offenders against the laws of the land when therefore romanist writers attempt to draw a parallel between the martyrs of the anglican church under queen mary and the priests who suffered in the reign of elizabeth it is a sufficient answer to their cavils to allege the fact that the former were put to death according to the mode prescribed in cases of heresy which was an offence against religion the latter were tried and executed for treason which is an offence against the state it is the remark of archbishop tillotson that we have found by experience that ever since the reformation they have continually been pecking at the foundations of our peace and religion when god knows we have been so far from thirsting after their blood that we did not so much as desire their disquiet but in order to our own necessary safety and indeed to theirs in fifteen eighty three somerville attempted to kill the queen the plot was discovered and its author only escaped a public execution by strangling himself in prison in fifteen eighty five another plot was revealed parry who had been employed on the continent came into england with a fixed determination to take the life of the queen to this act he was instigated by the pope who sent him his benediction with a plenary indulgence for his sins he was discovered and condemned on his trial he produced the pope's letter which had been penned by one of the cardinals at this time when it was found that all the plots were secretly contrived or supported by the seminary priests certain severe statutes were enacted the priests whose only occupation in england was to stir up rebellion were commanded to quit the country or be subjected to the charge of treason these enactments were absolutely necessary for every priest was a traitor nor was it possible that it should have been otherwise where the pope himself encouraged them in their designs during this year sixtus v was elected pope in the room of gregory the thirteenth this pontiff walked in the steps of his immediate predecessors it should be stated that at this time the doctrine was inculcated that it was meritorious to kill heretics and those who were excommunicated to die therefore in any such attempts 
as those to which i have alluded was deemed the readiest way to the crown of martyrdom which was coveted by many members of the church of rome when such doctrines were believed we cannot be surprised that so many treasons and rebellions were contrived in fifteen eighty six the life of the queen was attempted by babington the plot was discovered and he and several of his accomplices were executed and thus it became necessary to frame new laws to prevent the plots of the seminary priests who flocked into england for the sole purpose of exciting rebellion a statute was therefore passed by which it was made treason for any one who had been ordained a priest by authority of the see of rome since elizabeth's accession to come into her dominions this act was charged with cruelty at the time and the charge is still repeated not only by romanists but by many other writers and yet the act was absolutely necessary in self-defence it was intended to keep the priests out of the country since their coming always issued in treason and the consequent loss of their lives let it be remembered that the laws against recusants were not enacted until the treasons of campion parry and others had rendered such a step on the part of the government unavoidable the course adopted to prevent the coming of the priests was a merciful one for it was supposed that they would not venture into england at the peril of their lives it was also a reasonable one since no sovereign was ever known to permit men to reside in his dominions who denied that he was the lawful prince and who endeavoured to withdraw his subjects from their allegiance or to stir them up to rebellion as early even as the reign of edward i to bring in a bull from rome was adjudged to be treason footnote by the twenty seventh elizabeth c two it was enacted because jesuits seminary priests or other priests come over into this realm of england of purpose as it hath appeared by sundry of their own examinations and confessions not only to withdraw her highness's subjects from their due obedience but also to stir up and move sedition rebellion and open hostility to the utter ruin desolation and overthrow of the whole realm if the same be not the sooner by some good means foreseen and prevented that it shall not be lawful for any jesuit seminary priest or other such priest being born within this realm ordained by any authority derived from the see of rome to come into be or remain in any part of this realm and if he do that then every such offence shall be taken and adjudged to be high treason and every person so offending shall for his offence be adjudged a traitor this statute was rendered necessary by the treasonable practices of the priests had they not been engaged in such practices the statute never would have been devised the only way in which it can be said that such priests suffered for religion is this namely that their religion led them into treason but this would be to charge all their sufferings upon the church of rome herself which is indeed the fact though romanists will not admit it End of footnote. the next year a similar plot which was devised by an englishman of the name of moody was brought to light all these attempts were directed against elizabeth herself and though englishmen were the traitors who engaged to carry the plots into execution yet they were encouraged in their work and supported both by the pope and the king of spain the intention of the papal party was to dethrone elizabeth and seat mary queen of scots on the throne no one will justify elizabeth in taking the life of mary but it may be observed that if no attempts had been made against the queen's life and if the court of rome had acted justly and honourably the ministers of elizabeth would never have recommended the execution of that unfortunate queen her death must be attributed to romish principles and to the papal attacks on the protestant religion footnote at this time cardinal allen an englishman 
published a defense of Stanley's treason, maintaining that in consequence of the Queen's excommunication and heresy, it was not only lawful, but a duty to deprive her of the kingdom. End footnote. The year 1588 is memorable in English history for the defeat of the Spanish Armada, impiously called the Invincible Armada. Several years were occupied in its preparation, and the enemies of England expected to overwhelm the country by one stroke. At this time, the Pope issued another bull against the Queen, in which it was pretended that she was deprived of her royal dignity and kingdom, while her subjects were absolved from their allegiance. The same document commands all Englishmen to unite with the Spaniards on their landing, and to submit themselves to the Spanish general. Ample rewards also are promised to any who shall deliver the proscribed woman, as she is termed, into the hands of the papal party, while a full pardon was granted to all who should engage in the enterprise. It was determined that King Philip should hold the kingdom in fee from the Pope. To accomplish their purpose, the armada was fitted out though king philip was the individual by whom the armada was fitted out yet he was encouraged in the designed invasion by the pope as well as by the english fugitives on the continent headed by sir william stanley the war with portugal had for some years prevented philip from bending all his energies towards the conquest of england being successful in his attempts on his neighbours and also in the east indies it was argued by his flatterers that equal success would attend his efforts against england nor was another argument forgotten as a spur to his diligence namely that the conquest of england with the consequent re-establishment of popery would be an acceptable service to god who had given him his great success against his enemies and that no action could be more meritorious it is stated that a hundred monks and jesuits accompanied the expedition while cardinal allen an englishman was appointed superintendent of ecclesiastical affairs throughout england after having suffered much from the fire of the english fleet as well as from the violence of the tempests many of their ships being disabled it was determined to attempt to return home through the northern ocean at this time the powder of the english fleet was almost exhausted so that the departure of the spanish vessels at this juncture must be regarded as an interposition of divine providence in favour of our country many of the vessels which thus escaped from the english fleet never reached the coast of spain being wrecked in different places elizabeth displayed a most magnanimous spirit during the time that the armada was hovering around our coasts she addressed the army in terms calculated to inspire them with confidence and to endear them to her person. A solemn fast had been observed when the danger threatened, and when the deliverance of the country was manifest, a solemn thanksgiving was offered up in St. Paul's Cathedral on the 8th of September, when some of the Spanish ensigns lately taken were hung about the church. On Sunday, September 24th, the queen herself proceeded to st paul's and on arriving at the west door she knelt down within the church and in an audible voice praised god as her only defender against her enemies it was further ordered that the nineteenth of november should be observed as a day of thanksgiving throughout the country which day was annually commemorated during the reign of elizabeth footnote several medals were stamped in commemoration of the defeat one bore this inscription under a fleet flying with full sails venit vidit fugit another the following dux fomina facti several medals were also stamped in the low countries End footnote. in fifteen ninety urban the seventh became pope he was succeeded in a very brief space by gregory the fourteenth who was also speedily succeeded by innocent the ninth nor did innocent occupy the papal chair for any lengthened period 
in consequence of the defeat of the armada and also of the rapid changes in the holy see three popes having died within the space of eighteen months there was a slight cessation from the attempts against elizabeth in fifteen ninety two clement the eighth was elevated to the popedom and under his auspices there was a revival of the previous practices which had not been given up but merely relinquished for a season during the years fifteen ninety two fifteen ninety three and fifteen ninety four several persons were commissioned by the court of rome to raise rebellions in england and to poison or assassinate the queen the watchful eye of providence however was extended over the country and the queen every plot was discovered every hostile design failed and the only sufferers were the traitors themselves patrick cullen received absolution and the sacrament a d fifteen ninety two from the jesuit holt by whom it was determined to be a meritorious deed to kill the queen and in fifteen ninety four williams and york came over to england for the same purpose having first received the sacrament in the jesuits college in the year fifteen ninety seven squire came over from spain with the same object in view namely the assassination of the queen he was also instigated by walpole a jesuit from whom he received the sacrament under a promise to put the project in execution and then conceal the deed it was observed by sir edward coke that since the jesuits set foot in england there never passed four years without a pernicious treason about this time the english fleet obtained a most decisive victory over the spanish in fifteen ninety eight philip of spain the great enemy of england was removed by death from the scene in which he had for so many years acted so conspicuous yet inglorious a part in fifteen ninety nine and sixteen hundred a rebellion was headed in ireland by ter owen this rebel chief was as usual encouraged by the pope who sent him a plume of feathers as a token of his favour in sixteen o three the queen died in peace from the preceding abstract it will appear that from the year fifteen seventy to sixteen hundred queen elizabeth and the protestant religion were constantly exposed to the machinations of the active partisans of the roman see who were encouraged by the pope himself every pontiff pursued the same course there was a settled purpose at rome and indeed throughout the whole romish confederacy to dethrone elizabeth and overturn the anglican church nor is it a libel on the church of rome to say that in all these proceedings she acted on recognized principles principles which had received the solemn sanction of her councils to root out heresy by any means within their reach was deemed or at all events was asserted to be a sacred duty incumbent on all the members of the church of rome the doctrine may be denied in the present day when times and circumstances do not permit of its being carried out into practice but unquestionably it was not merely believed as an article of faith in the days of elizabeth for we have seen that the attempt was made to enforce the bull which was issued against the queen james i succeeded to the throne at a period when the eyes of romanists were fastened on england as their prey during the latter years of elizabeth the emissaries of rome were comparatively quiet in the hope that james from a feeling of filial reverence toward the memory of his unfortunate mother would not be unfavorably disposed towards their church it is certain however that a plot was in agitation before the death of elizabeth being managed by some of those individuals who were impatient of waiting the course of events on the queen's death the confessions and examinations of the conspirators show that the powder plot was partly contrived before james's accession several of their number went into spain to stir up the spanish court against the queen and to request a foreign army for the subjugation of england the death of elizabeth took place while those proceedings were going forward on the continent and was the means of suspending the operations of the conspirators for a season 
as soon as james accession was known the king of spain endeavoured to enter into a negotiation for peace so that the conspirators were not at this time openly favoured by that monarch it was supposed that some concessions might be obtained from james in favour of his roman catholic subjects but in a very short space the leaders of the conspiracy discovered that they were not likely to gain much by negotiation unquestionably the romanist party in england endeavoured to induce the king of spain to attempt an invasion of the country and it is equally certain that their solicitations would have been taken into serious consideration if queen elizabeth had not died had the project of invasion been realized the conspirators would not have proceeded to execute the gunpowder plot on the accession of james therefore there was a calm but it was deceptive it was only the calm before the storm and to the eye of the careful observer it indicated anything but prosperity and tranquillity it was evident to most men of reflection that the storm was gathering nay there were indications of its approach though no one knew how or where it would burst forth the rolling of the thunder was as it were heard in the distance though whether it would approach nearer or pass away altogether was a question which no one could determine i have glanced at the various treasons with which the whole reign of elizabeth was so pregnant and the principles from which they flowed have also been slightly alluded to namely the principles of the church of rome respecting the punishment of heresy and the keeping faith with heretics the doctrine of the church of rome on this subject as expounded by the jesuits and especially by parsons who at this period was one of the prime movers of every conspiracy against the english sovereign was this namely that if any prince should turn aside from the church of rome he would forfeit his royal power and that this result would follow from the law itself both human and divine even before any sentence was passed upon him by the supreme pastor or judge this doctrine was a consequence of the papal supremacy the doctrine of the supremacy is this that the bishops of rome as successors of saint peter have authority derived to them from christ himself over all churches and kingdoms and princes that in consequence of this power they may depose kings and absolve their subjects from their allegiance bestowing the kingdom of the offender on another that excommunicated princes are not to be obeyed and that to rise in arms against them or to put them to death is not only lawful but meritorious acting on these principles clement the eighth issued certain bulls in which he called upon all members of the church of rome to use their exertions for the purpose of preventing the accession of james whenever queen elizabeth should depart this life under such circumstances was james the first called to the throne the papal party were resolved on the execution of their designs and the pope and the king of spain were so far implicated that they were fully aware if not of the particular nature of the intended plot yet that certain schemes would be resorted to for the accomplishment of the grand object which was the subjugation of england to the papal yoke had the conspirators been successful they would have been furnished with all necessary supplies for their purpose by the court of rome and those states which were in alliance with the holy see such a combination could not have been defeated by human means especially as the plot was carried on with the utmost secrecy but the watchful eye of divine providence was fixed on the country and the designs of its enemies as will be shown in this narrative were mercifully frustrated the bulls above alluded to were to be kept secret as long as the queen survived they were addressed to the clergy the nobility and the commons who were exhorted not to receive any sovereign whose accession would not be agreeable to the pope 
the reasons assigned by his holiness for recommending such a course were the honor of god and the restoration of the true religion and the salvation of immortal souls the cardinal de assat to whom they were at first entrusted wrote to king james on the subject expressing a hope that he would openly profess the religion of his mother it will be seen in a subsequent chapter that these bulls were committed to garnet who confessed that they had been in his possession and by whom they were destroyed when it was found to be impossible to prevent james from succeeding to the english throne never perhaps in the history of the world was a sovereign delivered from more conspiracies than queen elizabeth the efforts of her enemies were unceasingly directed to one object and that object was the queen's death not only were private individuals instigated to attempt her destruction but the most extensive confederacies were entered into by almost all the papal sovereigns of europe a remarkable circumstance is related of the hopes and intentions of the spaniards in the event of success in the armada a spanish officer who was taken prisoner was examined before the privy council he confessed that their object in coming was to subjugate the nation to the yoke of spain and the church to that of the pope he was asked by some of the lords what they intended to do with the catholics as some must necessarily have fallen to which question he promptly replied that they meant to send them directly to heaven even as they should have sent the heretics to hell well, this statement rests on the authority of the chaplain to the army it was revealed to him in order that he might publish it the next day in his sermon to the troops he states that by commandment of the council he did publish it to the army in those days there were no newspapers nor was it then so easy to communicate intelligence by placards or bills we find therefore that the pulpit was often made a vehicle for publishing the common news of the day at a subsequent period during the commotions between charles i and his parliament when the latter obtained possession of most of the pulpits they were the only channels through which many of the people were made acquainted with the progress of the war whatever had occurred during the week was published to the people from the pulpit on the sunday footnote for a description of the proceedings of the parliamentary divines in publishing the news of the day from the pulpits during the civil war the reader is referred to my former work a history of the english episcopacy from sixteen forty to sixteen sixty end footnote king james therefore succeeded to the english crown at a period when the pope and the papal sovereigns entertained the most sanguine hopes of re-establishing popery in this country and when numbers of jesuits and their disciples were ready to execute any treason which might be concocted end of chapter one Chapter 2 of Guy Fox, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. 1605. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Guy Fox, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. 1605, by Thomas Ladbury. Chapter 2 Sketches of the Conspirators. The persons actually engaged in this atrocious deed were few in number, at the outset indeed very few, but the design was gradually revealed to others, though even when the discovery actually took place the number was comparatively small. That there was a general belief among the Romanist body that some great and effective blow would be struck is a fact which I need not attempt to prove, since it is so well known that no doubt can be entertained on the subject but how the design was to be carried into effect was a secret to the great body of the roman catholics the conspirators were thirteen in number their names are as follows robert catesby robert winter thomas percy thomas winter john wright christopher wright everard digby knight ambrose rookwood francis tresham john grant robert keys guy fox and bates the servant of catesby of this number five only were engaged in the plot at its commencement 
the rest being associated with them during its progress. Several of them took no active part in the mine. They were, however, in the secret, and furnished the money necessary to carry on the work. Three Jesuits, as will appear in the narrative, were also privy to the design, and counseled and encouraged the conspirators. They were Garnet, Gerard, and Tesman, alias Greenway. I shall endeavor to place before the reader such particulars as I have been able to collect, respecting all these individuals, before I enter upon the narrative of the plot. Robert Catesby Catesby was the contriver of the conspiracy. Footnote. In his youth, he was entirely devoted to dissipation, but in 1598, his zeal for the Church of Rome was suddenly revived. He was a native of Leicestershire, a man of family and property, and of such persuasive eloquence that he induced several of the conspirators to comply who otherwise in all probability would not have been implicated in the treason. Some of them admitted that it was not so much their conviction of the justice of the cause that led them to engage in the business as the wily eloquence of Catesby. He was descended from the celebrated minister of Richard III. Little, however, is known of him beyond the part which he acted in the gunpowder treason. It is evident that he was a man of considerable abilities, but being a bigot to the principles of the Church of Rome, he was a fit instrument for the execution of any plot, however horrible. Whether he was influenced by the Jesuits, or whether prompted to undertake the deed by his own feelings on the subject of popery, is a question of no easy solution, since, in consequence of his death, when the rest of his companions were taken, no confession was given to the world, which would probably have been the case if he had been brought to trial with other conspirators. He was the only layman with whom the Jesuit Garnet would confer on the subject of the plot. Thomas Percy this gentleman was nearly allied to the Earl of Northumberland, by whom he was elevated to the post of Captain of the Gentlemen Pensioners. He appears to have been a man of great violence and temper, and his conduct proves him to have been a staunch bigot to popery. Catesby on some occasions found it necessary to restrain his violence, lest his indiscretion should mar the whole contrivance. On one occasion he offered to rush into the presence chamber and kill the king. He was killed with Catesby at Hallbeach shortly after the discovery of the treason. Thomas Winter. It appears that Winter had contemplated a departure from England altogether when Catesby, who had entered upon the plot, requested him to quit the country whither he had retired till an opportunity should offer of going to the continent and to come with all speed to London. The scheme was proposed to Winter, who evinced no indisposition to enter into the plot. On the contrary, he appears to have complied with the utmost readiness with all of Catesby's plans. Soon after this interview, he went over to the continent to reveal the design to some influential papists, with a view to ascertaining their opinions on the subject. Winter appeared at his execution to be penitent, but no hesitation was manifested by him at the first, nor does he appear to have entertained any scruples during the progress of the conspiracy. In many respects, he appears to have been an amiable man, but such principles as are inculcated by the Church of Rome are calculated to quench all those feelings of kindliness which naturally exist in the human heart. The breast of Thomas Winter was steeled by his principles against the kindlier emotions of our common nature. It is related of him that he dreamt, not long before the discovery of the treason, that he saw steeples and churches stand awry, and within those churches strange and unknown faces. When he was taken in Staffordshire, an explosion of gunpowder took place, and some of the conspirators were scorched, and otherwise injured. At this time, his dream was recalled to his remembrance, and he fancied that there was a resemblance between the faces of the persons he had seen in his dream and those of his own companions. The recollection of the dream appears to have made a strong impression on him at the period when he was taken into custody. Robert Winter This gentleman was the brother of the preceding, by whom he was drawn into the conspiracy. Robert Winter was added to their number some time after the mine had been commenced. The circumstance caused some distress to Thomas Winter, who petitioned the court at his trial that, as he had been the cause of his brother's ruin, his death might be considered as a sufficient atonement to the law for both. Winter was taken in Staffordshire, where he retreated after the discovery of the plot. For some time, he was concealed in a house whose occupant was a Roman Catholic. The circumstance that led to his discovery was somewhat singular. The cook was surprised at the number of dishes, which were daily taken to his master's room. He, therefore, to satisfy his curiosity, peeped through the keyhole, when he saw a person sitting with his master. He was alarmed, both on their account and on his own. 
but his fears for his own safety being greater than his apprehensions for winter and his master he determined to make a discovery to one of his relations this step was followed by their apprehension guido or guy fox fox was a soldier of fortune who for some years was engaged in the spanish service little is known of his early life except that he was a native of the county of york and received his education in the city of york the writer of the life of bishop morton informs us that the bishop and fox were schoolfellows together in that city his subsequent history to the period of the treason is but imperfectly known he appears to have been a bold and daring adventurer as well as a gloomy bigot to the worst principles of popery and was in consequence deemed by catesby to be a suitable instrument for his purpose his proceedings in the mine as well as on the continent will be noticed in the prosecution of the narrative john wright john wright was early engaged in the plot with catesby it was agreed between these two individuals catesby and wright that an oath should be administered to all who should engage in the conspiracy the oath will be given in the narrative john wright was killed in the struggle with the sheriff in staffordshire where most of the conspirators were taken subsequent to the discovery of the plot christopher wright this person was the brother of the preceding by whom he was induced to enter into the conspiracy he appears however to have entered into the business with as much zeal as any of the rest he was the first to discover the apprehension of fox on the morning of the fifth of november his advice was that each conspirator should betake himself to flight in a different direction from any of his companions had this advice been followed several of them would probably have succeeded in making their escape to the continent the conspirators however adopted another course which issued in their discomfiture in staffordshire where christopher wright was also killed thomas bates bates was a servant and the only one of the conspirators who did not move in the rank of a gentleman when the plot was concocting he was servant to catesby the leader in the treason catesby observed that his actions were particularly noticed by his servant the circumstances led him to suspect that bates was in some measure acquainted with their designs or at all events that he suspected that they had some grand scheme in agitation in the presence therefore of thomas winter catesby asked him what he thought the business was which was then in contemplation bates replied that he thought they were contriving some dangerous matter though he knew not what the particulars were he was again asked what he thought the business might be he answered that he thought they intended some dangerous matter near the parliament house because he had been sent to take a lodging near that place bates was then induced to take an oath of secrecy when the particulars were made known to him it was then stated that he must receive the sacrament as a pledge that he would not reveal the matter with this view he went to confession to tesman the jesuit telling him that he was to conceal a dangerous matter which had been revealed to him by his master and thomas winter and which he feared was unlawful he then disclosed the whole plot to the jesuit desiring his counsel in the business tesman charged him to keep the matter strictly secret adding that he was engaged in a good cause and that it was not sinful to conceal the plot bates then received absolution and the sacrament in company with catesby and winter such were the means used to draw bates into the conspiracy francis tresham tresham was also engaged in the plot at an early period he was not one of those with whom it originated but it was revealed to him when the parties were in want of money to enable them to carry on their scheme he offered to contribute two thousand pounds towards the grand object he died in the tower before the trial of his companions ambrose rookwood rookwood was a man of fortune and until he became implicated in this plot of reputation he was not one of the original contrivers of the treason but was drawn into it by strong affection for catesby who appears to have exercised over him a most extraordinary influence john grant grant was a resident at coventry and like tresham and rookwood did not labor in the mine but was made acquainted with the scheme after it had been concocted grant seized upon several horses on the morning of the sixth of november supposing that the explosion had taken place with a view to the seizure of the princess elizabeth then on a visit in the neighborhood he was taken with the other conspirators in staffordshire robert keys little is known of this individual but according to his own account at his trial his circumstances had always been desperate as well as his character such a man was therefore ready for any enterprise however criminal 
Fuller relates the following circumstance, which I give in his own quaint language. A few days before the fatal blow should be given, Keyes being in Tickmarsh in Northamptonshire at his brother-in-law's house, Mr. Gilbert Pickering, a Protestant, he suddenly whipped out his sword, and in merriment made many offers therewith at the heads, necks, and sides of several gentlemen and ladies then in his company. It was then taken for a mere frolic, and so passed accordingly, but afterwards, when the treason was discovered, such as remembered his gestures, thought he practiced what he intended to do when the plot should take effect, that is, to hack and hew, kill and destroy all eminent persons of a different religion from himself. Sir Everard Digby. This gentleman was descended from an ancient family, resident in Rutlandshire. His education was entirely directed by priests of the Church of Rome, his father dying when he was only eleven years of age. He was introduced to the court of Elizabeth at an early period of his life, and soon after the accession of King James he was knighted by his majesty. Sir Everard was made acquainted with the plot during its progress, when the early and original conspirators found themselves in want of money. He promised to furnish fifteen hundred pounds. He was taken after the discovery and was executed in London. Henry Garnet, three Jesuits, Garnet, Gerard, and Tesman, were implicated in this conspiracy. The two latter escaped to Rome. Garnet alone was taken and executed. It is remarked by Fuller, A treason without a Jesuit, or one of Jesuited principles therein, is like a dry wall without either lime or mortar. Gerard must be the cement, with the sacrament of secrecy to join them together. Garnet and Tesman, whelps of the same litter, commended and encouraged the design. Garnet received his early education in Winchester School, when Bishop Bilden was warden. It is said that he was engaged in a conspiracy among the boys, whose design was to cut off the right hand of their master. At this time, Garnet was at the head of the school. His conduct, in other respects, seems to have been so immoral that he was advised not to offer himself as a candidate for a scholarship at New College. He quitted Winchester for Rome, where he enrolled himself in the Society of the Jesuits. At length he was made the superior of his English brethren, in which character he returned into England to promote a rebellion against Queen Elizabeth. Other particulars respecting his subsequent career will appear in the narrative. Thus I have endeavored to give a brief sketch of the actors in this dark transaction. In reading the pages of history, we feel a natural desire to know something of the persons whose exploits are recorded. The particulars which I have given in this chapter are such as could not so well have been stated in the narrative. All other matters, however, relative to any of the preceding individuals, will be woven with the history on which I am now about to enter. Other individuals were taken and executed for treason in consequence of their joining in the conspiracy, but the parties mentioned in the preceding sketch were the only persons who were actually implicated in the plot by any decided acts. It is pretty evident, too, that very few persons, besides those actually engaged, were fully acquainted with the particulars of the plot. It was the policy of the conspirators to reveal the precise nature of the design to as few as possible, feeling assured that the smaller the number of actual traitors, the less was the risk of discovery. They were also aware that all, or at all events, most of the Roman Catholics would join them when the design was carried into execution. The Jesuits, who were privy to the plot, intimated to the great body of the Romanists that some great design was in agitation without specifying particulars. The actual plot, therefore, was confined to very few persons, but that a plot of some kind was going forward was believed by the great body of the Roman Catholic population throughout the country. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Guy Fox, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. 1605. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Guy Fox, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. 1605, by Thomas Ladbury. Chapter 3 Proceedings of the Conspirators to the Latter End of October 1605. Enough has been detailed in the first chapter to show that it was the aim of the Romanists throughout the reign of Elizabeth to overturn the church and to assassinate the queen. On James' accession, the same measures were resorted to by the papal party, while the plots for the destruction of Protestantism were as frequent as ever. In tracing the origin of the powder plot, it is necessary to look back to the close of the reign of Elizabeth. In December 1601, 
Garnet, Catesby, and Tresham sent Thomas Winter into Spain with a view to obtaining assistance from the Spanish monarch against England. It was always found in the projected invasions of England that one of the chief difficulties was the transportation of horses. To obviate this difficulty, therefore, the Roman Catholics of England, or Winter in their name, engaged to provide 1,500 or 2,000 horses for the use of the Spanish troops on their landing on our shores. At this time, one of the English Jesuits was resident in Madrid, and by this man Winter was introduced to one of the secretaries of state, by whom he was assured that the king was anxious to undertake any enterprise against England. The king of Spain further promised the sum of 100,000 crowns to be devoted to this special service, and that he would effect a landing on the shores of England during the next spring. Winter returned home at the end of the year, and communicated his intelligence to Garnet, Catesby, and Tresham. The death of the queen took place soon after, when Christopher Wright was sent over into Spain by Garnet for the purpose of conveying intelligence of the queen's death, and also for the furtherance of the negotiation which had already been entered into during the previous year. Fox also arrived in Spain soon after Wright. He had been sent from Brussels by Sir William Stanley and Hugh Owen, two Englishmen who had been concerned in most of the treasons against Elizabeth. Some of the Jesuits were concerned in all the treasons to which I have already alluded, and the gunpowder treason was managed by the same party, the actors being either Jesuits or the disciples of Jesuits. Jesuits were their directors, their confessors, and their governors. I never yet knew a treason without a Romish priest, said Sir Edward Cock, at the trial of the conspirators, and on Garnet's trial he declares, Since the Jesuits set foot in this land, there never passed four years without a most pestilent and pernicious treason, tending to the subversion of the whole state. Shortly before the death of Elizabeth, and while the negotiations just mentioned were going forward in Spain, the Pope, Clement the Eighth, addressed to the English Romanists the bulls to which I have already referred in a former chapter, by which they were instructed to oppose any one who should claim the crown after Elizabeth's death, unless he would promise not merely to tolerate the Roman Catholic faith, but to promote it by all means in his power. These bulls were to be executed, quando conque contingerit miserum ilium fame ex hoc vita etc., whenever it should happen that the miserable woman should depart this life. On James's accession, therefore, many of the Romanists were tampered with by the Jesuits, and persuaded not to render obedience to his majesty as being a heretic. They were told by the Jesuits that they ought even to submit to death rather than obey a heretic. King James was, however, quietly seated on the throne, notwithstanding the secret practices of the Jesuits backed as they were by the king of Spain and the Pope. As it was dangerous to keep the two bulls in his possession, Garnet committed them to the flames after James's accession. Now it is altogether manifest that the treason originated in these bulls of Pope Clement VIII, for the conspirators argued, when the lawfulness of the undertaking was discussed, that if it was lawful to prevent James from possessing the throne, it was equally so to remove him though he had taken possession. I see not how this argument can be overturned by the Romanists, or how they can clear the rulers of their church of that day of the guilt of that dark transaction. The circumstances of the country, therefore, at the time of James' accession, were very peculiar. The Pope had issued his bulls to prevent any but a papist from succeeding Queen Elizabeth. The King of Spain had promised assistance to the English Romanists, and Garnet, with some other Jesuits, and Catesby and his companions, were resolved to execute the design of His Holiness. It was under such circumstances that the plot was contrived. The King of Spain, however, refused to contribute money or to send troops when he heard of James' accession, with whom he wished to enter into a peace, and to whom he sent commissioners for that purpose. The disappointment of their hopes in obtaining assistance from Spain led the conspirators, Catesby and his brethren, to devise some other means by which their object might be obtained. Frequent meetings took place, and various plans were considered and then relinquished. At length it was determined to undermine the Parliament House and destroy the king by means of gunpowder. It appears that Thomas Winter had some misgivings, lest the Church of Rome should suffer in the estimation of the public if the plot should be defeated. Catesby replied that the nature of the disease required a very sharp remedy. Winter's scruples were removed, and he entered into the project with all his energies. Still, Winter started difficulties, which Catesby was most expert at removing. He objected the difficulty of procuring a place from which they might commence their labors for the mine, but Catesby encouraged them by proposing to make the attempt, and that, if it failed, they might desist from anything of the kind afterwards. It seems that Catesby conceived the plan during the spring, A.D. 1603. Thomas Winter states that he was requested to meet him in town, where, after receiving a second letter, he found him with John Wright. 
at this meeting they conversed on the necessity incumbent on them of doing something for the cause of their religion and country for these men forsooth professed to be patriots winter expressed his readiness to hazard his life in the cause and catesby made known his project thomas winter then went to the continent to meet fox to whom he was to make known the fact that a plot was in agitation they met and returned to england the following spring when they were joined by catesby percy and wright at one of these meetings percy came into the room and said shall we always gentlemen talk and never do anything catesby took percy aside for a few minutes percy proposed to kill the king but catesby said no tom thou shalt not adventure thy life to so small a purpose at this time the plan was partially concocted by catesby but was revealed only to winter catesby and winter agreed that an oath of secrecy should be administered before the plot was fully disclosed to their companions who though they were all anxious to enter upon any project however desperate were not yet acquainted with the plan which had been devised by catesby though winter and fox had met on the continent and had travelled together to england yet it does not appear that the latter was made at that time acquainted with the treason he came to england with winter with a view to the contrivance of a plot but with the particular scheme projected by catesby he was not acquainted until after his return to the continent he was a reckless character and ready to join in any desperate enterprise fox in his own confession declares that the matter was at first broken to him in a general way by winter the parties were now five in number namely catesby fox percy thomas winter and john wright according to agreement they all met together in a room near st clement's church in the strand here they administered an oath of secrecy to each other on a primer when the oath had been taken they all went into the next room and which was the jesuit gerard from whom after they all heard mass they received the sacrament gerard was probably acquainted with all the particulars of the plot he was aware of the designs and intentions of the conspirators for he waited in the room for the express purpose of uniting them together into a common bond for treasonable purposes as soon as these ceremonies had been passed through catesby and winter unfolded to the rest the plan which had been devised and observed that the oath had been taken in order that the plot might be concealed fox and the rest fully approved of all that had been done entering into the plot with the utmost alacrity in the spring of sixteen o four therefore the plot was concocted the oath was couched in the following terms you shall swear by the blessed trinity and by the sacrament you now propose to receive never to disclose directly nor indirectly by word or circumstance the matter that shall be proposed to you to keep secret nor desist from the execution thereof until the rest shall give you leave the next point was to secure a house near the house of lords in which the mind might be convinced fortune in this respect appeared to favour them for during winter's absence on the continent catesby had heard that a particular house adjoining the house of lords might probably be secured inquiries were made on the subject when it was discovered to be in the occupation of a person named ferris who rented it of one of the officers of the house of lords by whom some of the rooms were occasionally used for parliamentary business percy was dispatched by catesby on the business and after some difficulty he succeeded in becoming tenant to winyard the officer as ferris had previously been fox assumed the character of percy's servant the keys of the house being committed to his keeping the name under which he now went was johnson they also hired another house in lambeth for the purpose of stowing away the gunpowder and the wood previous to its being deposited in the mine the house was one in which catesby often lodged their object in depositing their materials on that side of the river was to avoid detection for they were fearful lest by constantly entering the house in westminster the suspicion of some of the inhabitants might be awakened it was at this period that keys was admitted into the secret and to him was committed the charge of the house in lambeth during these proceedings the parliament was adjourned to the ensuing february an event which afforded abundance of time for their project and therefore they agreed to quit london for a season intending to return sufficiently early for the completion of the work before the opening of the session the conspirators departed in different directions in order to avoid suspicion it was about a month before the commencement of michael moss term that the parties quitted london about the beginning of the term fox and winter met catesby they all agreed that it was time to commence their operations when the parties arrived in london they were rather staggered by the discovery that the scottish lords were appointed to assemble in percy's house to discuss the question of the union of the two kingdoms in consequence of this occupancy 
they were not able to begin the mine until the eleventh of december sixteen o four late at night they entered upon the work of darkness the powder had already been procured from flanders and deposited in the house at lambeth not only did they provide themselves with the necessary tools for excavation but they took in with them a stock of provisions consisting of biscuits and baked meats so that they might not be under the necessity of sending out the adjoining shops for provisions and thereby excite suspicion now it must be remembered that these conspirators were quite unaccustomed to laborious employments yet their mistaken zeal in the cause of popery which they seemed to have regarded as the truth induced them to apply themselves to the task with unceasing energy they continued at their labor from the eleventh of december until christmas eve without any intermission nor did they appear in the streets until that day at this time they had conducted the mine under an entry close to the wall of the parliament house under propping the earth as they proceeded with wood fox as being the least known of the party acted as sentinel to give the alarm in the event of danger in his own confession fox acknowledges i stood as sentinel to decry any man that came near whereof i gave them warning and so they ceased until i gave notice again to proceed the object in placing fox as sentinel was this namely that they might cease from their labor as any one approached lest the noise should be heard and a discovery ensue winter whose confession was very full and minute informs us that during the progress of the work they held many conversations relative to the steps to be taken after the execution of the deed they hoped that the king and the assembled lords would fall a sacrifice in the explosion but then there were the prince of wales and the duke of york and how were they to be dispatched it was supposed that the prince might attend the king and share in the same fate and percy who all along had evinced great boldness undertook to secure the duke percy held an office near the court and was acquainted with several of those who were employed in the royal household he therefore undertook to enter the chamber after the blow was struck and having placed others at the doors to secure the young prince it was also determined that the king's daughter elizabeth who subsequently became queen of bohemia and from whom the house of hanover is descended she being the mother of princess sophia and grandmother of george i should be secured by some of their party in the country the princess was at this time with lord harrington in the county of warwick not very distant from catesby's house it was arranged therefore that the roman catholics of that neighbourhood should assemble under the pretence of a hunting match upon dunsmore heath and that the princess should be seized during the confusion that would be subsequent on the discovery of the plot money and horses were also necessary and the conspirators at this stage of their proceedings did not neglect to make provision respecting both these and other subjects were discussed in the intervals of relaxation from their laborious employment in the mine another very important topic was also introduced during these secret conversations it related to the lords whom they should endeavour to save from the general destruction it was determined that they should prevent as many of the roman catholic lords as possible from attending the house on that occasion but that the rest must necessarily perish with the great body of the peers it was also debated whether they should reveal the project to any foreign princes a difficulty here stared them in the face namely that they could not enjoin secrecy by a solemn oath as they had done among themselves nor were they certain that the continental princes would approve of their design they had little hope from spain because the king was too slow in his preparations and was ready to enter into negotiations with james france was too near and could not safely be trusted such were the views of france and spain these discussions took place while they were engaged in the mine at this period parliament was again adjourned until the fifth of october on which account the conspirators ceased from their operations intending to commence their labour sufficiently early to enable them to bring the matter to a completion previous to the period fixed for the opening of the session early in the ensuing spring they removed the powder which had been stowed in the house at lambeth into percy's residence their labours were now resumed with redoubled energy the foundation wall of the house of lords was nine feet thick so that their progress was necessarily very slow they were obliged to chisel out the stones and the mortar the wall being exceedingly hard they advanced only about a foot in a week these labours were continued during a fortnight when they deemed it necessary to admit some others into their secret to share with them in their toils it was at this period that christopher wright and robert winter were admitted into their party the same process was adopted in the omission of these men as had been resorted to in the first instance they were sworn to secrecy and the oath was confirmed by receiving the sacrament with this accession to their strength they continued in the mine until easter at which time they had advanced about halfway through the stone wall while occupied in their work 
they were one day suddenly alarmed by a noise which seemed to proceed from no distant spot the conspirators had provided themselves with weapons intending if they were discovered to sell their lives as dearly as possible these weapons were now grasped by the whole party and fox was sent out in order to discover the cause of the noise he soon returned to his companions whose fears were banished by his report fox discovered that the sound proceeded from a cellar which had been used for coals and which was under the house of lords the coals were now selling off the person who had rented the cellar being about to quit and the noise which had alarmed them was occasioned by the falling down and the removal of these coals this cellar was most convenient for their purpose for it was exactly under the throne the grand object therefore was now to secure it fox soon ascertained that it was to be let percy immediately hired it pretending that he wished to use it as a coal cellar for his adjoining house thus far they appeared to prosper in their dark enterprise the mine was now relinquished and it was resolved to deposit the powder in the cellar their labors were discontinued and all their energies were exerted in making arrangements to secure the success of their design footnote in piercing through the wall nine foot thick says fuller they erroneously conceived that they thereby hewed forth their own way to heaven but they digged more with their silver in an hour than with their iron in many days namely when discovering a cellar hard by they hired the same and the pioneers saved much of their pains by the advantage thereof book x page thirty five they were led to believe from this circumstance that god was evidently favorable to their design End footnote hitherto catesby had himself borne the expenses of the treasonable undertaking but his resources were insufficient for the charge of maintaining the party for the rent of several houses and for the purchase of the materials with which the scheme was to be carried into effect it was deemed necessary therefore that some moneyed person or persons should be made acquainted with the design in order that pecuniary aid might be procured and catesby proposed that he and percy and another of the conspirators should be permitted to disclose their secret to such persons as they and their discretion might deem desirable the proposition was agreed to by the whole party who now amounted to seven in number this plan was adopted because the parties thought that several of the wealthy romanists would be willing to contribute pecuniary aid though they might be unwilling to disclose their names to the whole number of the conspirators having made this arrangement fox was employed in depositing a large quantity of powder and wood in the cellar which had recently been taken the house was cleared of all those things which might have awakened suspicion while everything was placed in the cellar a place which no one visited they began now to contemplate making another trial of their friends on the continent catesby proposed that fox should go over assigning two reasons for his absence first that he might not be seen in england for a time and secondly that he might acquaint sir william stanley and mr owen with their proceedings it was however determined that the same oath of secrecy should be administered to these two gentlemen fox quitted england about easter stanley was absent from brussels to which place fox had repaired but he made the matter known to owen who cordially entered into the project in the month of august fox again returned to england about the same time catesby and percy met in the city of bath for the purpose of calling in others to render pecuniary assistance agreeably to their previous determination it was at this stage of the plot that sir everard digby and francis tresham were made acquainted with the design neither of these gentlemen scrupled to enter into the plot it was a most extraordinary thing that gentlemen otherwise of strict integrity should have been so influenced by their religious views as to concur in such a design without hesitation which seems to have been the case sir everard digby engaged to furnish fifteen hundred pounds and mr tresham two thousand pounds towards the accomplishment of the object percy also promised to obtain as large a sum as possible from the rents of the earl of northumberland rookwood and grant were made acquainted with the plot about the same time so that the number of the conspirators was now completed these gentlemen however never entered the mine they were merely privy to the treason and promoted it by rendering pecuniary assistance when these matters were arranged between catesby percy and tresham fox and thomas winter procured some fresh powder and placed it in the cellar as they intended it should stand for the explosion all things being thus arranged by the conspirators the parliament was again prorogued until the fifth of november an event which dispersed the party for a time this third prorogation alarmed the conspirators who imagined that their plot was discovered to ascertain whether their suspicions were well founded they mingled with the crowd on the day of the prorogation 
in order that they might watch the proceedings of the commissioners they were satisfied that their suspicions were groundless so that they went into the country in high spirits about ten days previous to the fifth of november catesby and fox returned to the neighbourhood of london several of the traders met together at white webb's on enfield chase at this time they were informed that the prince of wales would not be present at the opening of parliament whereupon they determined on seizing him after the explosion the duke of york afterwards charles i was so safely guarded that they entertained but slight hopes of getting him into their power down to the end of october therefore all things seemed to favour the designs of the conspirators while the intended victims were unconscious of the danger to which they were exposed still the watchful eye of divine providence was fixed upon the king and the peers and the schemes of the traitors secretly as they were carried on were revealed by one of those remarkable events which no human understanding can fathom the remark of fuller on the frequent prorogation of parliament deserves attention as if divine providence had given warning to these traitors by the slow proceedings and oft adjourning of the parliament meantime seriously to consider what they went about and seasonably to desist for so damnable a design as suspicious at last it would be ruined which so long had been retarded but no taking off their wheels will stay those chariots from drowning which god hath decreed shall be swallowed by the red sea i have now brought the narrative down to the latter end of october sixteen o five the conspirators were in and near london fox alone as the individual who was to fire the train taking his post in the cellar or the adjoining house as catesby's servant the parties were very cautious in all their proceedings so that they met together secretly whenever a meeting was necessary as the powder and wood were deposited in the cellar and nothing remained to be done in london the conspirators hovered near leaving fox to manage the firing of the train they were full of sanguine expectations respecting the event and busied themselves at this period in forming plans for securing the young princess and for carrying their ulterior designs into execution their attempt was however frustrated by an overruling providence End of chapter 3chapter four of guy fox or a complete history of the gunpowder treason a d sixteen o five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ed damera guy fox or a complete history of the gunpowder treason a d sixteen o five by thomas lathbury chapter four the jesuits privy to the plot the narrative continued down to the period of the discovery of the treason before the narrative is carried further it will be desirable to allude to those clerical individuals who were privy to this conspiracy the actors were as has been seen laymen but there were some priests of the church of rome and members of the order of jesuits who were no less implicated in the design than those who actually worked in the mine. Garnet, Gerard, and Tesmond were Englishmen by birth, and yet, for the sake of advancing the interests of the Church of Rome, they hesitated not to enter into the plot. Garnet was evidently a man of considerable attainments, nor is there any reason to believe that he was not, in many respects, an amiable man. His principles, however, were such that he could, without scruple, enter into a conspiracy against his sovereign and his country. There is reason to believe that he was privy to the design from the commencement, if he did not even suggest it to Catsby. At all events, these Jesuits were made acquainted with all the proceedings of the conspirators, whom they aided and encouraged in their work by such counsel as the church of rome is accustomed to impart to her deluded votaries even catsby at one time had his scruples he was not satisfied that it was right to sacrifice several roman catholic peers who would be present at the opening of the session his scruples were submitted to garnet it is however more than probable that catsby applied to garnet in order that he might be able to remove the scruples of others should any arise a case therefore was proposed and to the following effect whether for the good of the church against heretics it would be lawful amongst many nocents 
to destroy some innocence? Garnett replied that, if the advantage to the church would be greater, by taking away some of the Roman Catholic lords, together with many of their enemies, it would be lawful to destroy them all. Indeed, says Fuller, the good husbandman in the gospel permitted the tares to grow for the corn's sake, whereas here by the contrary counsel of the Jesuit, the corn, so they reputed it, was to be rooted up for the tares' sake. He also gave an illustration from the case of a besieged town, which must be subjected to the horrors of war, even though some friends of the besiegers are dwelling within its walls. It was this determination of Garnett's that quieted the doubts of the whole party throughout the proceedings. Rookwood was staggered when the matter was first proposed to him, but he was satisfied when Catsby mentioned Garnett's decision. The Jesuit wished to obtain the formal consent of the Pope, but Catsby argued that it had been already granted in the two bulls, the object of which was to prevent James from succeeding to the throne. Keyes was induced to enter into the plot by these arguments, while Bates, Catsby's servant, was assured by another Jesuit not only that he might lawfully conceal, but actually participate in the treason. It has already been stated that Bates confessed to Tesmond. In the Church of Rome, confession precedes the sacrament, and in confession, Bates revealed all the particulars of the plot. Still, he was encouraged in the treason by his ghostly counsellor. In short, the evidence of the participation of the Jesuits in the plot is of such a description that it cannot be disputed by anyone who examines it. The narrative has already been brought down to the autumn of 1605, when the Parliament was prorogued from October to November the 5th. On Saturday evening, October 26th, ten days previous to the day fixed for the opening of Parliament, a letter addressed to Lord Monteagle was delivered by a person unknown to his lordship's footman in the street, with a strict injunction to deliver it into his master's own hands. This circumstance took place at seven o'clock, just as the nobleman was about to sit down to supper. The letter was put into his lordship's hand by the servant. On opening it, he found it written in a very illegible hand and without any date or subscription. Montagle summoned one of his attendants to assist him in deciphering the epistle, which was couched in the following terms. My lord, out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care of your preservation. Therefore I would advise you, as you tender your life, to devise some excuse to shift off your attendance at this Parliament. For God and man have concurred to punish the wickedness of this time. And think not slightly of this advertisement, but retire yourself into your country, where you may expect the event in safety. For though there be no appearance of any stir, yet I say they shall receive a terrible blow this Parliament and yet they shall not see who hurts them. This counsel is not to be condemned, because it may do you good, and can do you no harm, for the danger is past, as soon as you have burnt this letter. And I hope God will give you the grace to make a good use of it, whose holy protection I commend you. Footnote. A strange letter from a strange hand, by a strange messenger. Without date to it, name at it, and, I had almost said, sense in it. A letter which, even when it was opened, was still sealed, such the affected obscurity therein. End footnote. Dark indeed were the words. In the first instance, Monteagle viewed the matter as a hoax, intended to prevent him from attending the opening of the session. Still, he deemed it the safest course not to conceal its contents. Accordingly, he hastened off to Whitehall at that late hour when, too, the streets of London were not lighted as they are in our day, and submitted the letter to the Earl of Salisbury, Cecil, one of the secretaries of state. 
it does not appear that cecil laid much stress upon the letter at the same time he expressed an opinion that it might refer to some design of the papists respecting which he had received some information from various quarters his information however did not relate to any plot but merely to an attempt on the part of the romanists at the commencement of the session to obtain a toleration for their worship and the relaxation of some of the penal laws various attempts have been made to shift the odium of the conspiracy from the church of rome and also from any members of that church some roman catholic writers have not scrupled to say that the whole was a trick of cecil's and that king james was privy to the design which was entered upon by the court for the purpose of rendering the romanists odious and to pave the way for more stringent laws against recusants the assertion that the whole plot was a trick of cecil's intended to render the romanist odious to their countrymen was not advanced till sixty years after the event no one at the time questioned the reality of the conspiracy the confessions of the parties in the secret letters of sir everard digby preclude the possibility of even entertaining such an absurd notion not one of the conspirators complained of being deceived into the plot either at his trial or execution nor did any of their apologists deny the fact of the treason the assertion was worthy of that church from whom it proceeded mr hallam the most unexceptionable witness thus argues on this point but to deny that there was such a plot or which is the same thing to throw the whole on the contrivance and management of cecil as has sometimes been done argues great effrontery in those who lead and great stupidity in those who follow the letter to monteagle the discovery of the powder the simultaneous rising in arms of warwickshire are as indisputable as any facts in history what then had cecil to do with the plot except that he hit upon the clue to the dark illusions in the letter to monteagle of which he was courtier enough to let the king take the credit james's admirers have always reckoned this as he did himself as vast proof of sagacity yet there seems no great acuteness in the discovery even if it had been his own he might have recollected the circumstances of his father's catastrophe which would naturally put him on the scent of gunpowder in recent times however it has been the policy of roman catholic writers to represent the conspiracy as the act of a few desperate characters desperate indeed they were yet they were not men of desperate fortunes nor had they suffered under the execution of the laws but the sole principle that influenced them was one of religion they were willing to risk all for the sake of promoting the interest of the church of rome it will also be seen hereafter that the pope and some papal sovereigns approved of the deed as to the report that the court were aware of the design long before the search which was made in consequence of the letter it is as destitute of foundation as the other the court knew that some design was on foot nor were they surprised since such had been the case throughout the reign of elizabeth and the court was still composed of the same great statesmen as to any knowledge of this particular plot the court were not in possession of it the king of france had informed the ministers that some secret plot was going on but beyond this information the court had no knowledge on the subject the secular priests also who were protected by bancroft intimated that some dark plot was concocting but they were as ignorant of the particulars as the ministers all the information which james and his ministers received from the continent amounted to merely an assurance that a treason was hatching but respecting the traitors and their proceedings they could learn nothing these intimations undoubtedly rendered cecil and james suspicious of the letter to monteagle but the letter conveyed the first certain intelligence that the danger was so near and so imminent when cecil had read the letter he laid it before the lord chamberlain in the earls of worcester and northampton montego was anxious that it should receive every consideration they immediately connected the letter with the intelligence respecting the designs of the papists of which they had been previously warned 
it was determined therefore to submit the letter to the king and not to take any steps in the business until they had obtained his majesty's orders on thursday october thirty first the king returned from royston and on the next day cecil submitted the letter to his inspection it appears that cecil offered no opinion concerning the letter he merely placed it in his majesty's hands after a little pause the king expressed an opinion that it ought not to be despised cecil perceiving that the king viewed the matter more seriously than he had anticipated referred him to one sentence for the danger is past as soon as you have burnt the letter which he conceived must have been written by a fool or a madman since if the danger was past as soon as the letter was destroyed as if burning the letter could ward off the danger the warning was of small consequence the king connected the expression with the former sentence that they should receive a terrible blow at this parliament and yet should not see who hurt them taking the two sentences together the king immediately fancied that there was an allusion to some attempt by gunpowder an insurrection or any other attempt during the sitting of parliament could not be unseen could not be momentarily executed the king interpreted the clause thus that the danger would be sudden and as quickly over as the burning of the paper in the fire taking the words as soon in the sense of as quickly he suggested therefore that the letter must refer to an explosion of gunpowder and that the spot chosen for it must be under or near the house of lords it is remarkable that cecil himself had intimated to some of his colleagues before the king's return from royston that the letter must refer to an explosion of gunpowder the very same suspicion also crossed the mind of the earl of suffolk the lord chamberlain this suspicion however was concealed from the king by the two statesmen his majesty instantly took the same view of the letter though he was totally unacquainted with the opinions of his two counsellors popish authors have laboured to prove that the treason was either planned by or at least known to the court because the king so readily referred the letter to an explosion by gunpowder cecil and suffolk had conceived the same opinion though it does not appear that they thought of gunpowder secreted under the house of lords but what proof does this circumstance furnish of any previous knowledge even on the part of the court much less of contrivance was it strange that they should thus interpret such a mysterious letter cecil and suffolk were fully aware of the plots which had been devised against elizabeth they knew that on more than one occasion the traitors had contemplated the death of the queen by means of gunpowder with these facts fresh in their recollection it was perfectly natural to interpret the letter to signify some attempt of the same kind in short no other interpretation could reasonably have been put upon it that the king himself should have suspected some attempt by means of gunpowder was also to be expected he was well aware of the practices of the church of rome and it is probable that on this occasion he recollected the fate of his father king henry whose death was accomplished by an explosion of gunpowder to king james therefore really belongs the honour of discovering the gunpowder treason for though cecil and suffolk had conceived the same idea yet they do not appear to have entertained the notion of a mine under the house of lords besides the two lords did not communicate their suspicions to the king the remarkable part of the business therefore is the fact that the three individuals should have so readily struck upon the same idea it must however be stated that the interpretation put by the king upon the clause relative to the burning of the letter was not the true one for it is pretty clear that the writer wished monteagle to absent himself from the parliament and to burn the letter to avoid suspicion of being privy to the plot but though we may admit that the king's interpretation of the clause was not that which the writer intended yet we must acknowledge that his majesty's suggestion was most providential and sufficient to justify the strong language used in the act of parliament for the observance of the fifth of november let it be remembered that timidity was one of james's infirmities and fear is usually very quick-sighted 
at this first interview with the king no plan was adopted for their further course the king suggested a search but cecil did not give his sanction it appears to have been his aim to delay the search a little longer and therefore he quitted the royal presence with a jest what his motives were for not complying with the king's suggestion cannot be ascertained in all probability he was anxious to consult his colleagues we may have thought that the king's apprehensions relative to the concealment of gunpowder under the house of lords were groundless he did not however think lightly of that matter though he jested with his majesty for he immediately laid the whole case before the lords with whom he had previously consulted telling them what the king had said and suggested it was agreed that cecil should wait on the king the next day the next day accordingly being saturday he introduced the subject again to the notice of his majesty at this interview the lord chancellor was also present it was now determined that the lord chamberlain by virtue of his office should examine all the parts contiguous to the house of lords and especially the lower offices in order that he might judge from the appearances which might present themselves whether there was a probability of any such danger to prevent the circulation of idle rumours as well as to allow the conspirators to carry their plans as near to completion as possible the examination was deferred until the following monday november fourth being the day preceding that fixed for the opening of the session it has never been satisfactorily ascertained who was the writer of the letter but it is remarkable that the circumstance was made known to the conspirators within a very brief space after its delivery to lord monteagle that one of the party penned it there can be no doubt for they had proceeded with such secrecy that no other person had any idea of such a design by the interposition of providence one who was anxious to save an individual nobleman from death brought destruction not only upon himself but also upon all his associates neither the writer nor the bearer of the letter was ever known it is probable that the writer himself was the bearer as it is unlikely that the man who could pen it and who felt so much anxiety about the life of lord monteagle would commit it to the custody of another on sunday evening october twenty seventh the day after the delivery of the letter a person called on thomas winter and related the circumstance this person was the servant of monteagle who had been called in to assist in deciphering the letter winter communicated the intelligence to catsby and recommended instant flight but the latter was determined to ascertain the exact amount of information which had been communicated to monteagle which he hoped to discover by watching the movements of the government agents near the parliament house winter therefore remained at white webs with catsby while fox was sent to london to watch the proceedings of the court fox left them on wednesday morning october thirtieth and returned in the evening with the gratifying intelligence that he found everything in the cellar just as he had left it they now hoped that the letter was disregarded and that the danger of discovery was over on the thursday winter returned to london and on friday he met catsby and tresham at barnet tresham who was related to monteagle's wife was suspected of being the writer of the letter and was questioned on the subject by catsby he denied however that he had any knowledge of the matter and it appears from winter's confession that his denial was believed by the other conspirators on saturday november second in the evening tresham and winter met again in lincoln's inn fields on this occasion tresham related several particulars of the interviews between the king and cecil how he became acquainted with these particulars does not appear both catsby and winter deemed it necessary now to think of flight but the former would not take that step without seeing percy who was not yet come up from the country on percy's arrival on the sunday he recommended that they should remain and await the issue all the conspirators were now in great perplexity on monday november fourth 
Catsby went into the country, and Percy to the seat of the Earl of Northumberland. Fox remained to fire the train, as had been previously arranged. At this time, therefore, they were uncertain whether they were discovered or whether the treason was still unknown. On Monday afternoon, agreeably to the previous arrangement, the Lord Chamberlain, accompanied by Lord Montagle and Wynyard, keeper of the wardrobe, proceeded to examine the rooms under the House of Lords. They came at last to the vault, or cellar, which had been taken by Percy. Here they saw the coals and wood which had been deposited there by the conspirators to conceal the barrels of gunpowder. The cellar was at the disposal of Wynyard, and it appears to have been his privilege to let it for his own profit. On being questioned by the Lord Chamberlain, Wynyard replied that he had let the cellar to Thomas Percy with the adjoining house, and that the wood and coals were the property of that gentleman. At this stage of the examination, the Lord Chamberlain saw a man standing in a corner of the cellar, who stated that he was Percy's servant, and that he was left by his master in charge of the house and cellar. This individual was Guy Fawkes, who was appointed to fire the train. The Lord Chamberlain carelessly remarked to Fox that his master was well provided by his large stock of fuel against the blasts of winter. On leaving the cellar, Lord Monteagle intimated his suspicion that Percy was the writer of the letter. This suspicion entered his mind as soon as Percy's name was mentioned, recollecting the friendship that had subsisted between them. Footnote. I quote the following passage from the continuation of the history of England from Sir James Mackintosh in Lardner's Cabinet Cyclopedia, for the purpose of showing how unqualified the continuator is for the task which he has undertaken. Search was accordingly made, and the powder was found concealed under billets of wood and faggots, but all was left in the same state as before to lull the conspirators into security. Such is the way in which this gentleman writes history. It will be seen from the narrative that, at the search to which this writer refers, the gunpowder was not discovered. The parties returned to the council, and having made their report, it was debated whether the search should be carried further. What dependence can be placed on the statements of a writer who confounds two circumstances with each other, or rather is not aware of more than one search, or attempt at a search having been made. End footnote. The Lord Chamberlain returned immediately to the King, to whom, with the council, he related all that he had seen, mentioning also the suspicion of Lord Monteagle respecting Percy. He expressed his surprise that so large a quantity of fuel should be deposited in the cellar, when it was well known that the house was seldom occupied by Percy. It appears, too, that he did not consider that the appearance of Fox was much like that of a servant. The king still insisted that it was necessary to make a rigid search, and that the wood and coals must be removed. It occurred to him that they were placed there to conceal the gunpowder, for it was His Majesty's firm conviction that some such attempt was alluded to by the writer of the letter. The members of the council, who were then present, concurred also in the same opinion. Still they were in doubt as to the mode in which the search should be conducted. They were, on the one hand, anxious for the safety of the king's person, and, on the other, fearful, lest, if nothing of the kind should be discovered, they might be exposed to ridicule for entertaining groundless fears, unbecoming in statesmen and the ministers of the crown. It was suggested also that, if the search proved fruitless, the Earl of Northumberland might feel himself aggrieved, in consequence of his relationship to Percy, the owner of the house. All the members of the council agreed in the necessity of instituting a search, but their opinions respecting the manner in which it should be effected widely differed. James insisted that they must necessarily adopt one of two courses, either search the cellar narrowly, or leave the matter altogether, and go to the house the next day, just as if no suspicion had ever existed. It was therefore determined at length 
that a search should be made but to prevent any sinister report supposing nothing was discovered it was ordered that winyard the keeper of the wardrobe should search the cellar under the pretense of having lost some of the hangings which had been placed in his custody the king also suggested that the search should be conducted under the direction of a magistrate accordingly sir thomas nivett a magistrate for westminster proceeded with a small and chosen band to the parliament house at midnight while the king and his councillors remained at whitehall at the entrance to the cellar they discovered fox standing with his cloak and boots on as if about to take a journey he had just made all his arrangements within when the magistrate and his party approached nivett apprehended him immediately and then the party proceeded to remove some of the wood and coals they soon came to a barrel of gunpowder and in a short space the whole number amounting to thirty-six were discovered the next step was to search the prisoner fox they found on his person matches and all other things necessary for his purpose a dark lanthorn was discovered in a corner of the cellar fox made great resistance when the party attempted to search his person but as soon as he was secured he expressed his sorrow that he had not been able to fire the train which he asserted he would have done if he had been within the cellar at the moment when he was taken instead of being at the door besides the lanthorn and the matches there was found on the person of fox a pocket watch at that time such a thing was very uncommon he had procured this watch in order that he might ascertain the exact hour for firing the train such little incidental notices served to show the state of the arts and sciences at particular periods with their subsequent progress better than the most labored treatises on the subject at this time we learned that small watches for the pocket were very uncommon for the fact that such a watch was found on the person of fox is mentioned as a rare circumstance what a contrast between that period and the present day and yet in many of the fine arts the age of james i and charles i vastly excelled our own in the mechanical arts however it was greatly inferior sir thomas nivett having secured fox returned to whitehall about four o'clock on the morning of tuesday the fifth of november so that the discovery took place exactly twelve hours before the time when the train would have been fired if parliament had assembled the magistrate communicated everything to the lord chamberlain who rushed without ceremony into the king's chamber exclaiming that all was discovered that all was safe and that the traitor was secured all the members of the council who were in london were now summoned to attend within a short space fox was placed before them in order that he might be examined respecting this unheard-of treason the prisoner appeared before them undaunted neither the awful situation in which he stood nor the numberless questions which were put to him by those who stood by moved him in the least he not only avowed his participation in the treason but regretted that he had not been able to execute it alluding to the discovery he remarked that the devil not god was the author of that discovery during the whole day the council could extract nothing from him by their examinations he took all the blame upon himself refusing to name any of his accomplices but acknowledging that he was induced to enter upon the treason from religious motives alone he denied that the king was his lawful sovereign inasmuch as he was a heretic at this time he refused to disclose his true name calling himself john johnson servant to thomas percy in a few days however being in a prison he made a full confession of his guilt Thus was discovered one of the darkest treasons with which our annals have strained. Divine Providence interposed, just at the moment when the conspirators believed that their expectations were about to be realized. The merit of the discovery must certainly be attributed to the king, for though it is clear that the letter evidently pointed to something of the sort, yet before the treason was discovered, 
most of those to whom it was submitted were in much doubt as to its meaning the king alone suggested that the vaults under the house should be searched and in such a case who can deny that the thought in the king's mind was suggested by a higher power let king james says fuller by reading the letter have the credit of discovering this plot to the world, and God the glory for discovering it unto King James. Wilson's words were much to the same effect, being discovered by a light from heaven and a letter from one of the conspirators, when the fire was already in their hands as well as raged in their hearts to put to the train. Half an hour before their time, when it was expected that the king would enter the house, Fox was to place a match in such a position that, after burning during that space, should fire the train. He was to set sail for Flanders for the purpose of obtaining succors from foreign princes, and the rest of the conspirators were to manage matters at home. It is said that those Jesuits who were privy to the design, but who could not publicly appear, were appointed to meet on a certain spot on Hampstead Hill, that they might behold the conflagration caused by the explosion. This spot is still designated Traitor's Hill. There is, indeed, a story which would lead to the belief that Fox was to have been sacrificed by his brethren in crime. I give the story as it is recorded in the histories of the period, without pledging myself to its truth. At Tickmarsh, in Northamptonshire, resided a Mr. Pickering, who had a horse remarkable for its speed. Keyes, one of the conspirators, is said to have borrowed this horse shortly before the period fixed for the opening of the session. Fox, after having fired the train, was to proceed to St. George's Fields, where he would find the horse in question on which he was to make his escape. This was the impression on Fox's own mind. It was further arranged that Mr. Pickering, who was a well-known Puritan, should that morning be murdered in his bed and secretly conveyed away, and that Fox should also be murdered in St. George's Fields, and so mangled as not to be recognized by any one. A report was then to be circulated that the Puritans had perpetrated the atrocious deed, and to give some color to this report, the conspirators were to appeal to the fact that Mr. Pickering, with his swift horse, was there ready to escape, but that some persons who saw him, in detestation of so horrible a deed, had killed him on the spot and hewed his body to pieces. Thus the mangled body of Fox was to be taken for that of Mr. Pickering, it being supposed that no one would doubt the fact from the circumstance of the horse being found near the spot. It is added that Fox, when he was convinced that it was the intention of his companions to put him to death, confessed the whole plot, which he would not have done but for his treachery on the part of his fellow conspirators. Such is the story, but I cannot vouch for its truth. Footnote. In a work published shortly after the discovery, I find it positively stated that Tresham was the writer of the letter to Montego. This merely shows what was the general belief at the time. End footnote. The fact that the vaults and cellars under the House of Lords were then let out to hire for such purposes, furnishes a singular view of the manners of the age when contrasted with those of our own times. It appears that the inferior officers of the House made the most of their privileges. At this stage of the discovery, the King and his ministers were ignorant of the mine which had been carried along from Percy's residence under the walls of the house of lords this was not known until some of the conspirators had made a discovery of all their proceedings great was the joy of the nation when it became known that such a treason had been brought to light and great was their gratitude to that omniscient being by whose gracious interposition the dark designs of the conspirators were frustrated end of chapter four Recording by Ed Demereaux.